All right, guys, good to have you. We're in a brand new series today. And Todd, by the way, Todd, thank you for being here. Uh, he's in uniform. He's on duty. So you mess with me and Todd will take you out of here, right? He's all ready to go. All right, good. We're in a new series, Running with the Wolves in First Peter. And uh, as, oh, wait a minute, back in the back, Michael Linehan. Michael helped us start Forge years ago. He's now in North Carolina, and he runs a lot behind the scenes of your PowerPoints that you see here. Let's give Michael a round of applause. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. All right. Well, Forge is about building great men as God defines greatness. God is emphatically about building men. He's been doing it for centuries. Started in the Garden of Eden, and uh, he's always about building men. And, and our belief here at Forge is as the men of the church go, so goes the church. That uh, the church never gets beyond the quality level of its men because God has called us into leadership in the church. So we are pro-local church, and we're pro-pastor as we want to support what God is doing in the greater Orlando area. And, and so we, we make the point here at Forge that discipleship and manhood go hand in hand. That you simply cannot separate, for men, you cannot separate discipleship and manhood. That when God brings a man to faith in Christ, he begins to really tweak and develop his manhood. And that's what we want. It's in our DNA. We want to be real men. And only God defines how we do that. I love the story of the, the manager of the company who was uh, trying to plan for his uh, successor. And so he was developing this young guy. And then he said, listen, I'm going to be out of here in a couple of months. And if you run into problems, I want you to know I put two envelopes in the, the center drawer of the desk. And if you run into problems in business, just go grab uh, envelope number one and open it up. And so the young man did. He took over and he ran into trouble. He went in to uh, uh, get the envelope open it up, and it just had these words, blame me. Blame me. And so he did, and it worked for a little while, and then he ran into another problem, and he said, hey, there's envelope number two. And, uh, and so he went in and got the envelope, opened it up. Envelope number two said, prepare two envelopes. Um, <laughs> and... Um, and, and, and I like that story because the reality is, is how easy it is for us to blame other people about what's going on in our lives, right? If things aren't going well, it's easy to work blaming other people. That works for about, well, in the short run. Blaming works in the short run, but it never works in the long run. Blaming others is like walking down a dead-end road. It just doesn't work. Uh, eventually, you, a man has to get to the point where he says, I'm taking responsibility for my life. No matter what's happened to me, no matter what people have done to me, no matter who has set my identity, I got to take responsibility for my own life. The other thing is, we don't have to run away from difficulties. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are God's deeply beloved sons, right? And so we can face ourselves and we can face our difficulties and we can move ahead. And that's how we thrive. That's how we can. By the way, this is different than just mere church attendance, isn't it? Discipleship's different than just going to church. Uh, just showing up because a guy can do that. And he can bring his iPhone, work his emails while the message is going on. Right? Not you guys, not forge men, but some people. It's easy to just go to church, but we're, more, we're about more than that. We're about discipleship and following Jesus. And uh, when we accept him as Savior and Lord, that's when things begin to happen. Running with the Wolves uh, is the name of our series. And uh, uh, we're going to be talking about thriving in danger. At Forge, most of the time we do series, and uh, periodically we go through books of the Bible. We've done Nehemiah, we've done the Gospel of Mark uh, in past years, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, we've done a bunch of them. So we're going to go through 1 Peter now, and we're going to be talking about running with the wolves, and I'll tell you why uh, as, we, as we jump into that. All right, but what, I got three questions. Look on your outline. See the, the first question? How do men grow more manly? Number two, how do we need, why do we need to grow more manly? Number three, how identity 201 makes us more manly? Are you ready? Because I got a core dump for you here this morning. I'm going to go quick on these first two points. And then I'm going to focus on the last one. But I got to go quick on these first two points. Are you ready? Here we go. 
All right, so, so how do men grow more manly, which means grow more Christ-like? How do we do that? The church has talked historically about the means of grace. The means of grace are the means that God provides us because of the gospel as to how we grow. How many of you have heard that expression, the means of grace? A few, not many of you. How many of you understood what it means? Well, uh, a lot of us don't. It's an old expression, but what it really means is that because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of the grace of God, that grace that, that leads us to salvation also leads us to sanctification, also leads us to maturity, doesn't it? Yeah, grace, the gospel is what energizes everything we do as men. And that's why we keep coming back to identity. So what are the means of grace? I said I was going to do this real quick, and I am going to do it real quick. Here it is. The Spirit of God is one of the means of grace. The Holy Spirit, once you accept Christ, He connects you to Jesus Christ and is that inward power that enables us to grow. The Holy Spirit is the means of grace. Acts 2.38, Peter said, repent, believe, and you will receive the gift of the... Holy Spirit. And sometimes we forget this. See, you guys know this stuff a lot of it, but you forgot it. And so one of the means of grace is the Holy Spirit within us that helps us grow into manhood. The Bible is a means of grace, right? All Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good way. That's 2 Timothy 3. So our daily appointment with, with God. You hear us talk around here about the dog, You've been called a dog sometimes, but our dog at Forge is our daily appointment with God. That's a means of grace, isn't it? When you meet with him, he transforms you and me. And then prayer is a means of grace. Pray without seeking, seek, ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5. Um, other Christians are a means of grace, Proverbs 27, 17. We've talked about these before, but it's good to review. Brothers in Christ. Now, Are all your brothers and sisters at church, are they all easy to spend time with? No. Church is a hospital and it's filled with sick people. (laughs) Really, right? And so when you walk, so on Sunday morning, say, how you doing? And you run into somebody kind of strange. And you can walk away and say, I love you in Jesus' name. And then when you walk away, you can say, you're a sick person. You need Jesus. That's why they're there. Don't expect your church to be perfect, Right? The only church that was perfect was the church I served for 30 years, and I lie about other things too. So the reality is there's no church that's perfect, uh, but God's people, that's why we talk about a fire team here being, helping us grow. Uh, I've been reading, I just finished it actually, this little booklet, The Hill Fights of uh, the First Battle of Khe Sanh, Vietnam, 1967. And the reason I started reading that book is that uh, we have a, a, a vet who was there in the hill fights in Longwood. He goes, he, and he has three purple hearts. Uh, he, he, they left him for dead overnight. You know, the hill fights in the northern part of Vietnam, they just, they, they said, go get these hills because we got to protect Khe Sanh, the air base. And they, and they sent patrols out, and these hills all around the, the, the base were saturated with North Vietnamese uh, regulars, which were trained by the Chinese. And we, we, our guys would go up there, and they'd just get obliterated. And um, it was absolutely stunning, because that was the, also the first use of the M16 that was jamming like crazy. So these guys would get off three or four rounds, and the M16s would jam. And, and, and the AK-47s, they, they worked really well. And the NBA had those. And our guys were dying because our, our, our M16s were jamming. And yet, what is so stunning about this is that in the midst of our guys getting blown away and cut to shreds, they would go after each other. They'd get their wounded. They'd carry them out. Uh, and, and that's what we're about at Forge. Uh, we, life is like running with the wolves. There are wolves out there. And if you don't think there are people out there to get you, you haven't read the New Testament. Satan is out to get you. It started in the Garden of Eden. And the reality is, is, is that we need each other. And so forge, at the end of the day, is a means of grace too. Other Christians are a means of grace. Brothers are a means of grace. Our, our, our personal and, what did I say, Sunday weekend worship 
Communion is a means of grace. These are all means of grace as we serve. Trials are a means of grace. James says trials help us grow. So guys, there's all these means of grace. This is how we grow. Screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis. I love that. Uh, uh, the senior demon talking to the junior demon says this. Aggravate that most human characteristic. The horror and the neglect of the obvious. Sometimes we don't grow, men, because we neglect the obvious ways that we grow. Christian men need to know how God shapes us. What are the means that he uses to develop us, to bring us to greatness? These are the means of grace, and we need to lean on them. Now, why do we need to become more manly? Why? Well, here are the reasons. Uh, that's his goal. Romans 8, 28, and some of you are not going to like what I'm going to say today. Okay? I'm telling you in advance, I've struggled with this myself. I was raised Baptist. I've struggled with this all my life. Here it is. Uh, oh, it's his goal. Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Catch this. For whom he foreknew, these he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. God, I don't know what word stuck out to you, but become conformed to the image of his son is the one I want you to hear right now. You were saved to become like Jesus. That's why we need to grow more like Jesus, because that's why we were redeemed, to get back to the original status. Uh, and then, uh, and, and then uh, as we have often seen, we men are the problem. I told you about that time I was flying on an airplane reading the Bible, and this flight attendant said, what are you doing? She knew what I was doing. She just wanted to start a conversation. I said, I'm reading the Bible. She said, I know. I said, what do you do? I said, I speak to men. She said, good, men are the problem. And I said to her, you're right. That's why we're doing what we do. And, uh, and so we often, why, why, because we're, we're often a mess. Why? Because we're underdeveloped. Why? Because Satan has been attacking us from the very beginning. Uh, and, and, and you are key. We are God's key plan for humanity. I know this sounds sexist. It's not being sexist, but read Ephesians 5. Uh, the man is the head of the wife, his wife, uh, Christ is the head of the church. We are crucial. God set it up that way. Gender is his idea. I didn't set it up. It's his idea. We're supposed to be the spiritual leaders. And so the reality is, is, is that we're the key to God's plan. And the world is a tough place. The wolves are everywhere. How many of you seen the Born series, Born Identity? Yeah, I love that. There's call, one uh, called the Born uh, Legacy or the, something like that. And in it, uh, it's not Jason Bourne, it's uh, a surrogate who is one of the guys in the program and he's out in Alaska and he's being chased by wolves and, and he makes the point, he says, wolves, he, he talks to another guy in that program where they're taking special chems that make them mentally and physically stronger. I kind of like that, I want some of those by the way. And, uh, but, but the wolves are chasing him and they don't normally chase him, he says. I looked it up, wolves don't normally chase human beings. However, uh, they do go after sheep quite regularly. And, and what are you and I? Jesus said, I send you out like sheep among the wolves. And wolves are everywhere. And, we need, and, and the world is a tough place. And the minute we start saying it's not, that's the minute we begin to fall. And so I want to I start First Peter by emphasizing with you how identity 201 makes us more manly and Christ-like by looking at this, these few verses. Because we're running with the wolves. And if we're going to run with them and thrive in the midst of danger, Todd, danger every day. I know you got your vest on underneath your shirt. Please keep wearing it. We thank you for your service. And, um, and we need you. We need you. But the church and your families need all of you. And, and so I, I, I want us to be prepared to run with the wolves and thrive. And know how to deal with the danger that is out there. This is how Peter starts. Look at the text if you got it. 
Well, I got it there for you. And bring your Bibles probably as we do this series in 1 Peter because I won't be able to put the whole text up there. But it starts out, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. All right, we're going to unpack that, but first of all, I want you to know who this, who this Peter is. Who is this Peter? The Apostle Peter, Simon Peter, 30 years after the resurrection. About 64 AD, 64 BC, Peter is not the guy who denied Christ anymore. Peter has grown in 30 years. Peter is a theologian now. First Peter has some of the best Greek in the New Testament. And scholars are skeptical. They say, how could Peter, a fisherman, untrained, write good Greek? I don't know. Maybe he had an editor that helped him. It's great Greek. But I'll tell you this. Peter, in 30 years, has grown. I've known Christians that have gone to church for 30 years and haven't grown up much. Because you can grow old and never grow up. But Peter has grown up. So, so I want you to know Peter and I want you to know your salvation. Let's unpack it. These are the words that we simply, I don't want you to miss. Now you're going to have table talk and you're going to have some time to clean up the heresy. And I've said it in advance. Some of you are not going to dis- not agree with me, all right? We got guys from every denomination on the planet here. Well, okay, that's a slight hyperbole. And we got guy. We got. We have a lot of pastors in this room, and I don't claim to be the pastor with all the knowledge. But this is where I'm at, so I'm unpacking this. It's helped me in a great way, and I think it'll help you too. First of all, Peter says that we are. What's the word? Aliens. And I look out there, and you don't look like aliens. You look like pretty normal guys. Uh, and yet, the, the 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 reality is is that we uh, are foreigners. The gospel changes us. That's what Peter is getting at. However you unpack this, he's dealing with people in Asia Minor who he calls aliens, Christians who are aliens. And that is partly a result of the gospel. Notice that this is used in Hebrews and 1 Peter 2. Colossians 1.13 says that we have been rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of God's dear son. When you became a Christian, you got transferred from the kingdom of of darkness into the kingdom of light. You became a part of the household of God. We're going to talk about that next week. And as a result, you're a part of the church, the body of Christ, and that means you're an alien in this world. Does it ever feel that way? Yeah, because you are. You're a foreigner. This is not your home, uh, really, anymore. And that's, and that's a good feeling if we as Christians feel a little bit alienated here. At the end of 1 Peter, look what he says, 1 Peter 5, 13. She, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Who's in Babylon, guys? Talk to me. The church in Babylon. And where's Babylon? Not in the east. It's a metaphor. Who is now considered Babylon? Rome, the city of Rome. Peter's, ri- Peter's writing from Rome. He helped Mark, his son in the faith, write the gospel of Mark. Where? From Rome. And so Peter says, she who is in, Ro- in Babylon, why? Because Rome was the new Babylon. Babylon was the corrupter of the ancient world before Rome became the corrupter of the ancient world. Where's the new Babylon, guys? Orlando, (laughs) California, thank you. (laughs) You might be right. New York, Los Angeles, the Western world, uh, yeah, you know. But Babylon is the world, is the world, the world allied again. You live in Babylon, don't you? You're an alien, you're a stranger, and that's important. And we've been scattered in the dispersion. The Greek word here is, is translated diaspora. Uh, you know, you, are, you live here in Orlando, and you've been dispersed here. Some of you were raised here. Some of you were brought here against your will because of a job. Some of you felt like you were called here. I was called here. I'm a Western. I'm a Californian. I know. It's crazy. Land of the fruits and the nuts. But I've been here for over 30 years. I've been called here. 
I've been dispersed here. You know why you're here? God put you here. You know why, you know why the church was in Rome? Because God put them in Rome. Why? Because he has his people all over the place. Why? Because his kingdom is a worldwide kingdom. And he wants us to be involved in spreading his kingdom where we are. If you don't like it here, find another place, I guess. But pray, Lord, maybe you have me here for a reason. To help you disperse your kingdom. But if you feel like an alien, that's okay. If you feel like you're scattered uh, and you, you feel a little diffused, that's good. Uh, but then he says, so who are we? We need to know our salvation. We're aliens. We're scattered. But thirdly, we're chosen. Ah, this is what will tick you off. Because the word is used 23 times in the New Testament. It is the Greek word electos. And it is translated chosen or elect. And this is what gives agita to so many Christians. And where there's great debate between those in the body of Christ who sometimes call themselves Arminians or those who call themselves Calvinists, those who call themselves followers of John Wesley or Martin Luther, uh, all across the spectrum. I, I was raised Baptist. And I went to seminary and I stumbled upon this stuff. And I was like, I'd come home and explain it to my wife, she'd cry. Because it blew our categories. And I finally decided that I was going to accept the biblical categories, uh, regardless of whether or not they fit my categories that I got growing up. And so I encourage you to think the same way. But the interesting thing about the word elect is that, is that everybody in the New Testament uses that word. Peter uses the word. John uses the word. Jesus uses the word. And there it is. There's one example. Many are, many are invited, but few are chosen. Few are the elect. Okay, so this reflects the reality that God is the king of heaven. And that as we see the reality of fallen humanity on the planet, Peter was trying to get it across to understand their salvation, that they were the chosen of God. I'm going to come back to this in the wrap-up because this is, this is identity 201 and how it helps us run with the wolves. Understanding that you are not, you're not a mistake. The next word is foreknowledge. Um, Acts 2, Peter, you know the interesting thing about Peter, and I'm not a Greek expert, but Peter uses nouns more than he uses verbs. And this word foreknowledge is used two times in the New Testament. Used two times in the New Testament. One other time, it's used of Jesus. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men. And so the word foreknowledge and predestination go hand in hand. That's why it says in Romans 8, using the verb, whom he foreknew, these he also predestined. I know, you don't like it. Foreknowledge does not mean that God looked ahead and saw what you were going to do. Foreknowledge means that he foreloved you. Because foreknowledge and predetermining go hand in hand. Just sink that in. Let it sink in. Talk about it. Like I said, and I always say, you can clean up the heresy around the table. You can disagree with me. You can be wrong. That's okay. No, no, no. Seriously, this is a, a big area of disagreement among Christians. And many of you know that. I just have never been able to get away from it. There it is. Now, so, so we're chosen by the foreknowledge of God the Father. Not that he looked ahead and said, hmm, you're going to accept. He made you. He helped you. called you by the Holy Spirit. So that, why? For, the, for obedience and the sprinkling by his blood. To be cleansed so that you would obey and follow Jesus. All right, let me wrap it up. And you can talk about this. Now, knowing yourself empowers you and me to run with the wolves. When we understand this, this empowers us to run with the wolves. Even if you don't like the idea of chosen, chosen, called, elect, you don't like it? Okay. But you are. At some level, you have to come to terms with that because this is used in the New Testament. Now, around here at Forge, we talk about identity, right? That uh, identity is, is the number one pillar of greatness. And identity is who you are. We, all, we talk about identity 101 around here all the time. You are God's deeply beloved, redeemed son, right? That's who you are. Because of the gospel, God is not angry at you, right? 
Are, you agree with that? Yes. He poured out all his anger on Jesus. So he's not angry at you. He doesn't have any anger left for you. Does he discipline you sometimes? Of course. Because you're his rebellious son sometimes. So am I. So he disciplines us, but he loves us. Identity 101 is you are the deeply beloved, redeemed son of the most high God. Identity 201 is this. You're not an afterthought with God. You're not an afterthought because he foreknew you, he foreloved you, and he predetermined that you'd come to him. That's identity 201. You're not an afterthought with God. Never were. Never could be. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for a nameless mass of humanity. He died for you by name and by face. Your face was running across his mind when he was dying on the cross for you. My sheep hear my voice, he said. I lay down my life for my sheep. You're one of them. You're not an afterthought with God, and you therefore could never have been an afterthought with Jesus. That's 201. Your identity just skyrocketed. By the way, when did he love you? Well, he loved you, it says uh, in Ephesians, before the foundation of the world. Read Ephesians chapter 1, if you don't believe me. Before the foundation of the world. Now, however your head comes around that, that's identity 201. And that enables you to deal with all of the bad stuff that people said to you when you were growing up or didn't say to you that they should have said to you. The blessing that you didn't get, the harsh words that you got, the abuse, the neglect, all of how people defined you in the past doesn't matter now in the gospel. It takes time to overcome it. But identity 201 says, I can run with those wolves out there, even if they tell me I'm a failure, because I know I'm not with the God of the universe. I can run with the wolves out there, even by those who demean me, because I know that I have a status that is absolutely impossible to replace. I cannot, by adding anything to my own life, Get better than the status that I have as God's deeply beloved and redeemed son. That enables me to stay in the fight. It's not a game. It's a fight. Every day is a fight. For your soul, your mind, your emotions, your service in your church, it's a fight. And Identity 201 says, I'm not an afterthought no matter what others people say about me. This gives us the ability to risk. One father, one father I heard about last week, uh, it, it, I wanted to find that guy and rip his head off. This guy, this guy used to put his cigarette butts out on his kid's forearm. Let's go find him, bring Todd and deal with that guy. The reality is some of you were dealt harshly like that. And you're still struggling to see who you are. The wolves are nipping at your feet, but your identity cannot be uh, improved upon. We can win this city. We have a vision that's bigger than us. We want to we people the churches with men who love Jesus, who want to grow. We can do it. We can, make, we can be the minority that makes an impact. We can run with the wolves. We can do it. Uh, we can have a long-term vision for something uh, bigger and better than us. See, wolves always go after that which is weakest and that which stands alone. And in Christ, we're not the weakest. We're, we're the strongest by his grace. And even stronger as we stand together. All right. Know your salvation, know who you are. Talk about it around your table. I'll get you out of here right on time. Here we go. You guys ready to hit the bricks? All right. Couple of announcements. 
on the back table as you walk out, the way we're doing our announcements, extra announcements, a lot of you like us to announce stuff. We can't always do that. Uh, and uh, But we do put announcements on the back table as you go out. So you can grab forms uh, out there. And the leap of faith, uh, Steve Brown, Paul, William Paul Young, the shack, uh, a dialogue taking place uh, at uh, St. Stephen's Community Church. It's going to be an interesting day. Grab one of these. Check it out. Also, Church Security Conference coming up. Jason. Both our guys over here. So that's coming up. There is a, a discount for Forge people. And, uh, and just know about that. Every church really needs to have some sort of security ministry at that point. It's just the way it is right now. All right, Forge Essentials. Invite a friend or an enemy. There it is. Uh, we've got them both. Uh, build your fire team. Remember that guy, that one or two guys that can help fight with, your, with you for your faith, as we talked about today. Uh, become a partner. Many of you are keeping us on the road. We have the three sites here, downtown today, lunch, and then Thursday morning in Longwood. And uh, so you can go to forgetruth.com, forgebiblestudy.com. We'll be dinking with those uh, websites in the future here, but that's where we are right now. If you want to be a partner, we'd love love to have it. Thank you for uh, your, your willingness to support us. And then sign up for the e-blast so you know what's going on. All right? All right. So uh, as we get ready to... Whoa. The theme song for this year is what? Tom Petty won't back down. That's because it's one of the great hymns of the faith. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> but it should be. It really should be. It really should be. And look at the words. There's nothing in there that's ungodly. It's all biblical theology. I love it. Don't back down. Run with the wolves, um, no matter what they say about you. Years ago, I spoke at uh, Man in the Mirror on Friday, and uh, Pat Morley does a first-timers table. So I was leading the first-timers table, and there was this big, I had darker hair then, and there was this big, imperious-looking foreigner sitting there with a big shock of black hair, and he was sitting there like this, and he kind of was intimidating, big dude. So we went around the table, and I said, uh, I said, what's your name? And he said it. It was an Iranian name. And he told us he was from Iran and he was a Christian. And I said, people that sometimes have said, I looked Iranian. You know, this was before 9-11, way before all that and all the bad stuff and terrorism. And he looked at me with this look in his eyes like I'm going to rip you in half. And he goes, you look like Iranian, but you look like terrorist. <laughs> you know. I said, thank you. At least I don't look like a pastor. <laughs> so um, that was rather a compliment. This week, uh, this week, you never know what people are going to say about you. You look like this. You act like this. You're a failure. You're not. Yeah, it doesn't matter because who, who defines you? God defines you. You cannot get better than how God defines you. Identity 101, 201. That's how we run with the wolves. That's why Peter started his book out reminding the Christians who were scattered aliens who they were. That's why we always start with who we are in Christ. Changes everything. So Sunday I heard a guy, his name is Yotis Kantartsis, senior pastor of, of one of the largest, well, the largest church, evangelical church in Athens, Greece. We were just there this summer. I uh, didn't meet him there. I met him here. Uh, but uh, he, if you go to, if, you know, the biggest thing in, in, in Athens is the Acropolis, right? Uh, over about 50% of all Greeks live in and around Athens. When you go up to the Acropolis, you can't believe it. You, you say, I understand that. Uh, they, they all live right around there. And he's pastor right down underneath the Acropolis. It's an incredible ministry that he has. He's an old guy now, but how many evangelicals do you think there are in, um, uh, in Greece? 0.2%. 0.2%. And um, that, means, that means you're an alien. That means people look at you as weird when they, you're a what? Because if you're not orthodox, an orthodox Christian, um, you're nothing. Uh, 0 0.2 percent. They don't. They don't get that. You're. You're an alien. Uh, you're a stranger. You're weird. And um, 
He says there's two things that happen when you're a minority. You either move toward isolation or assimilation. You move toward isolation or assimilation. And both of those are antithetical to the gospel. Isolation, when he took over the church, he's, he's done a lot in church planting. He's one of my new heroes about church planting now. It's an amazing guy. And um, he said the senior pastor came to him and gave him two, two, two pieces of advice. First piece of advice, live secretly. Second piece of advice. Don't bother them so they won't bother you. From a minister of the gospel. Horrible pieces of advice. So I say live openly. Bother them so they will bother you. We are not here to bring comfort for just this life. We are here to run with the wolves to give them eternal life. And if we don't run with them and thrive in the process, they won't know about Jesus. So you go out there today, remember who you are, and run with the wolves. But you'll get bit. Let's pray. Our great God, we honor you. Thank you. Thank you for making us men following Jesus at the beginning of the 21st century. Thank you for the joy that it is to be a man. Thank you that we get to, to be sacrificial uh, for, for the women, children, churches, and, and our culture, for those that don't even like us, for the wolves. Thank, us, thank you, Lord, that we get to have a life of significance. And thank you that you made that possible. One day we'll get home. And it'll be a whole lot better. It really will. But thank you that in the meantime, you have equipped us and gifted us to be your men right now. So be with my brothers. Be with me as we run with the wolves. We pray in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. See you guys. Have a great week.